Good afternoon, friends. Please be seated so that we can start our meeting. Dear friends, brothers and sisters present here in Adyar or watching via the internet, a warm welcome to you all. First of all, please put your mobile phone in the silent mode now. Thank you. Today, this 1st of January 2017, the public lecture of this convention will be delivered by our brother from the Philippines, Vicente Hao Chin Jr. Vicente Hao Chin Jr. is a former president of the Theosophical Society in the Philippines and is a clear example of how to live a theosophical life. He is actively involved in the Theosophical Order of Service. He is the founder of the Golden Link College in the Philippines, which provides transformational education for less privileged children. He is the author of The Process of Self-Transformation, Why Meditate on Education and Other Works. He compiled and edited the Chronicle edition of the Mahatma Letters to A.P. Sinet and is associate editor of the Theosophical Encyclopedia. This is the text from a leaflet of the flyer of the seminar Self-Transformation and the Spiritual Life at the International Theosophical Center in the Netherlands last July 2016. Vic presented self-transformation seminars in some 20 countries all over the world. The theme of this international convention of the Theosophical Society in Adyar is beyond illusion, a call to unity. Vic will talk about the religions of the future, a challenging object. I invent Vicente Haochin Jr. to talk to us. Thank you, Elf. Good afternoon to all of you, brothers and sisters, and to all those who may not be here, but are watching through the live broadcast. In the past several thousand years, religions have been very significant factors in the molding of human civilization. Ostensibly, they are supposed to improve mankind, make them more moral, and help people attain eternal happiness. In many ways, they have done so in history, but in many other ways, religions have become the sources of disharmony among peoples and have caused violence, wars, and even cruelty. Mankind has become so divided by religions that even political boundaries and military alliances have been drawn 
on account of religions. In 1996, there was a book published called The Clash of Civilizations by Professor Samuel Huntington. And he says in that book that the wars in the future will be waged less according to national boundaries, but according to ethnic and religious divisions. However, we don't have to look into the future in order to find that that is already happening because in the past several thousands of years, this type of warfare on account of religious divisions have been happening. For example, since the ancient times when according to biblical accounts, when Joshua massacred the Canaanites when they tried to enter into their cities, when Muhammad conquered and converted the countries in the Middle East into Islam, when the Christian countries launched the Crusades, which lasted for 200 years, when the Catholic countries warred with the Protestant nations in Europe and resulted in one of the longest wars in Europe, the Thirty Years' War. When the Arab countries launched a concerted attack, a concerted war against the newly founded nation of Israel, and when India and Pakistan waged several wars after their partition due to religious differences. Religious cultures have done many things it has nurtured great art. It has produced exalted music. It has produced magnificent architecture and produced great spiritual teachers. But at the same time, they have also spawned some of the worst forms of cruelties in history, such as the Inquisitions in Europe and today's religious terrorism. Terrorism before were often targeting military or government sites. But religious terrorism is very different, and it is a new phenomenon in modern times. It does not choose whether its victims are men, women, or children, whether enemy or friend, based on a promise of some heavenly reward for some such act. And this terrorism has never been seen before in history. In the field of learning, religions have established great centers of learning, especially in Europe, in the Middle East. But at the same time, it has also obstructed progress of science. For example, Galileo, one of the greatest scientists in history, was convicted and imprisoned and banned from writing anything because he thought that the earth revolved around the sun. The, the anti-scientific religious lobby can be so strong that even in modern times, such as in 1925, the state of Tennessee in the United States enacted a law that prohibited the teaching of evolution in public schools. And this law was only repealed in 1967. 1967 was a time when science was already so advanced that Russia and the United States have been able to send already cosmonauts and astronauts up to orbit in space. But as late as 1999, this was just about 17 years ago, the state of Kansas also prohibited the teaching of evolution. This decision was repealed and overturned about two years later. That's how strong this anti-scientific lobby can be. Now, thousands of books have been written about this detrimental side of religion that has caused so much division, suffering among people, and delay in human progress. In 2006, the British government television pro 
uh, station broadcast a series of documentary films entitled The Root of All Evils, ending with a question mark, hosted by Richard Dawkins on the harm that religious religions have done to mankind. We find a similar indictment in the Mahatma letters more than 100 years ago when the Mahatma Kuthumi wrote that two-thirds of the evil that we find in the world can be traced to this thing called religion. Why do many religions, which are supposed to help improve and, self and save mankind, produce such injurious effects on human civilization? Why these conflicts and divisions? Why not love and unity? Allow me to share with you some of the elements of religions that give rise to such effects. Let me say at this point that most of these elements are found, unfortunately, in the Abrahamic religions and less in the Eastern religions. The Abrahamic religions are those religions which trace the roots in Abraham, and these are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The first source of divisions and conflicts is a claimed inerrancy of scriptures. Among the Abrahamic religions, the scriptures are taken to be words of God and hence cannot be mistaken. In these scriptures, however, are so many statements that go against our common sense, our morals, our scientific and historical knowledge, that our, and our sense of justice. Because of such verses in these scriptures, religions have been intolerant, have condemned other religions, and they have led apparently sincere people to even become unjust and cruel. Here are some examples of commands of God found in such scriptures, and they are actual quotations. The first one is, take them and kill them, referring to unbelievers, wherever you find them, unquote. Another example is this, quote, utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, or cows and sheep, camel and ass." End of quote. I doubt whether an average person will take these as reasonable commands and follow them. Today, most biblical scholars are in agreement that these scriptures were written by people, compiled by people, and while many teachings are indeed inspiring in these scriptures, many of these accounts are based on the prevailing beliefs and traditions of those times. It would be incredible that God would say many of those things attributed to him which are evidently ungodly. Today, for example, the Catholic Church the largest denomination in Christianity, and Christianity is the largest religion in the world, the Catholic Church no longer believes that the world was created in six days, a belief that was held for centuries, that the world indeed was created in approximately 4004 BCE. It recognizes today the validity of archaeological discoveries and their implications on evolutionary processes in nature, contrary to, to, to what is literally said in the scriptures. But despite these changes, there are still thousands of major and minor religions and sects that still espouse a very fundament fundamentalistic view about scriptural truths. It seems to me that it will take hundreds of years before mankind will collectively transcend such narrow literalism and fundamentalism and be able to accept the fact that spiritual liberation can also be found through alternative pathways other than one's own religion. The second source of religious narrowness is reliance on institutional or hierarchical authority as a source of truth or dogma. 
I grew up as a Catholic, and I studied in a Catholic college, in the Catholic Church while I was growing up. And even now, the Pope is considered to be infallible, and the magisterium, the collective body composed of bishops, and, who, and which is considered as the source of authentic truths, would become a binding authority to all Catholics. Such an authority is usually official, but it can also be traditional and be based on popular impressions. This authority, this authority often carries with it the power to judge, to excommunicate, to condemn, and even to punish. When it is coupled with military and political power, then it can arrest, stone, or execute. And such a power has not only been abused in the past, but it is a source of perpetuation of obviously harmful doctrines and teachings. Giordano Bruno, a Dominican monk, and John of Arc were just two of the tens of thousands of people who were burned and executed for heresy or alleged witchcraft. John of Arc was declared a saint about 20 years later after she was burned as a heretic. Mansur al-Halaj was imprisoned and executed for declaring his spiritual realizations. The third source of divisions in religions is the exclusive claim to salvation. That is, that only those who belong to a particular church or religion will be saved or will go to heaven. This is one of the most pernicious because it makes religious authorities feel justified in persecuting or even massacring non-believers. The genocide of American natives by the Spanish conquistadores are an example, and these were horrible. For centuries, the Catholic Church, for example, declared that outside of the church, there is no salvation. I grew up in that belief, and all those who were not of my religion would go to hell, and only Catholics would go to heaven. Today, many present fundamentalist churches say the same thing, and this tendency is still very strong. Here is another statement from another religion. It says, whosoever opposes the messenger and follows other than the believer's way, we expose them unto hell. But the, wor the world is changing and the winds are changing. A recent declaration of the Catholic Pope, Pope Francis, has undermined this view at its very roots. And I do not know how many Catholics actually believe in what he says, but they don't dare question the Pope because the Pope is supposed to be infallible. And this is what he said. He said he assured atheists that even atheists can go to heaven provided that they are good people and they follow their conscience. Now this is absolutely revolutionary. Never in the history of Christianity has there ever been a statement by such a high official about the importance of ethical conduct over theology and doctrine. In other words, whether one believes in God or not, whether one believes in Jesus Christ or not, whether one believes in any of those doctrines or not, do not matter. What matters is ethical living. The fourth source of these divisions is belief in anthropomorphic God, a God that can get angry, jealous, vindictive, punitive, insecure, or dualistic, a God that evokes fear rather than inspires spirituality. Such fear compels loyalty to a particular God or religion, and as a result, human religious authority acts in the same way, angry, jealous, vindictive, punitive, and fearsome. Thus, instead of having a religion of love, 
a lot of the manifestations of modern religion can be one of hatred, fear. These are the things that are usually engendered. Now these four sources of religious divisions and dogmatism are not likely to dis disappear within the next 1,000 years. Based on the experience of human civilization on the past 2,000 years, look at how beliefs, attitudes, not only religious but cultural attitudes, have not changed in the past one or 2,000 years. Because of tradition, because of how young people are educated, human culture will carry on to later generation these same factors that have caused religious divisions. Now, as I said earlier, it is to be noted, and this is quite an important commentary, that these sinister qualities of religions are less seen in Eastern religion. It, it still can be seen, but much less, such as in Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, Shintoism, Jainism, and so on. Buddhism, for example, has easily blended with other religions that it encounters in other countries, in other cultures, without creating hostility, without creating violence or animosity. In the Philippines, for example, there are two Zen Buddhist centers. And guess what? The founders of these two centers were Catholic nuns. Nuns who were committed to the Catholic dogma doctrine. And yet, they adopted Buddhist meditation and spiritual practice and considered their Jap Japanese Zen teacher as their teacher, as their guru. Buddhist meditation... Uh, in India, in China, and Japan, Buddhism has easily intermingled with Hinduism, Taoism, Confucianism, and Shintoism. If we look farther into the future, what might be the qualities of the more enlightened religions of the future that will foster unity? I believe that such religions will have the following qualities. This list may not be exhaustive, but I'm just putting in, I think, what are the most significant. The first quality of the religion of the future is that such religions will no longer declare that their scriptures, whatever they are, are inerrant. Inerrant means cannot be mistaken or that they are infallible because this is the main source of division. They will see the religions of the future, they will see that no matter how inspired some portions of their scriptures are, they are still the products of human hands and hence subject to the limitations of the human mind. People will repudiate those parts that are evidently unscientific, unethical, and go against reason, common sense, and intuition. My first surprising experience in this was when I was studying theology in the Catholic college that I was studying in. And the professor was a Jesuit priest, a very saintly one. And when he came across the stories of the Old Testament, he just simply declared that this were not historically, tr historically true. And he wasn't even embarrassed by it. He just realized that there are deeper things that are truly spiritual but other things which cannot be literally taken as truth. Now, a question comes when we say that we can no longer rely on an external scripture as the source of truth or reality. The question arises in the minds of many believers, but how can we, mere mortals, decide as to what is true and what is false, what is valid or invalid? Can, should we not rely on something which is higher than us, such as a scripture? Unfortunately, if we think about it, we'll realize that 
There is no other way except for people to decide what is true or untrue, what is valid or invalid. If I accept a particular scripture as true, I made a decision to accept it. In other words, another person may say it's not true, I decide it's true. So in the end, I'm still the one deciding, not the scripture itself. If God were to show himself here in this hall at this very moment, each one of us will have to make a judgment whether it is an illusion or whether it is valid. And it, we may disagree on it, but finally, we still have to make the decision. Hence, in finding out about the truth, there is no other way but to develop our own faculties and of judgment and discrimination through reason, through common sense, and through intuition. And hence, this brings us to an important principle in our quest for truth. It is this, that the final responsibility to decide on what is true or not cannot be, can never be, relegated or assigned to an external power, be it a god, man, or scriptures. If a book says that Antarctica exists, and I've never been to Antarctica, it is the individual who makes the judgment that the book is reliable and can be trusted. If he decides that the book is not trustworthy, then he will not believe that Antarctica exists. Even if an individual tries to arrive at truth by proxy, in other words, I may say that a certain person is very believable. And hence, in other words, it is by proxy and not by direct experience. But it still is the individual who decides on whom to give that proxy. And thus we will see that the final goal of all educational, social, and religious efforts to improve mankind should be centered on the task of developing individual maturity by awakening one's highest faculties of perceiving reality. Again, if we think about this, we'll find that this cannot but be true. A dog, for example, an elephant, will be limited in perceiving reality because it has limited perceptive faculty. Once we reach the human level, then we, are, we have added faculties which enable us to see deeper truths and realities. But still, we are not omniscient. We are not, we don't know everything because our own mental faculties, our own rational faculties are limited and hence, the goal of, one of the goals of human life is to open up these faculties. It is the goal of education. It is the goal of all spiritual movements that human beings be helped uh, to awaken these faculties. Now the second quality I see as the quality of the religion of the future is that it will become non-dogmatic and will not enforce beliefs based on punishments or threats. This is a consequence of the first point that I have mentioned. The word dogma, we often use the word dogmatic. Now the word dogma is defined in the dictionary today as a teaching laid down by an authority as incontrovertibly true. Incontrovertibly, you cannot go against it. But the word dogma in its original Greek meaning is opinion. In other words, whenever a church, a religion, espouses a certain principle and it's called a dogma, it is originally intended to be an opinion. It is not something which is boxed as final tr truth. It is merely an opinion. I'll give an example in the history of the of Christianity. In the third century, there was a widespread controversy, a very important one, on whether Jesus was God or whether Jesus was not. There was a very prominent theologian, his name was Arius, who said that Jesus was not God. He was a limited being. And 
another person, his name is Athanasius, disagreed with him and, and uh, espoused that Jesus was co-equal with the Father or God. Now, this problem lasted for more than half a century. Debate here, debate there. There were years when Arius was the more popular person and his view was a more accepted one. At other times, it wasn't. At other times, it was Arius again. Then finally, the emperor decided that this too troublesome for his empire, and he commanded that a council be convened in order to decide finally one way or the other. And so the, the members of the council made a votation, and it favored Athanasius, which says that Jesus is God. And this principle has lasted since the fourth century up to today for almost 2,000 years, and it has become a dogma. But if it were not for such an edict that it should be voted upon, after all, the voters were also have their also have their own opinion. They did not; they were not omniscient. But it was just a matter of counting votes. And hence, today, these dogmas are actually the result of just the collective opinions of certain people before, more than 1,500 years before. If the winds during that time were different, then perhaps. Christianity would be, delivered, will be believing a different thing today. At best, what a wholesome religion can do is to convince its sympathizers to convince its sympathizers of the truth of its teachings without threat of organizational punishment. After all, a religion truly interested in truth will never be afraid of heresy. If this heresy is false, then eventually it will just disappear. If this heresy is true, then that church should adopt it without hesitation. Now, to some people, this may sound strange, this quality of freedom of thought in a religion because we tend to think that religion is not like that, particularly the Abrahamic religions. But in the East, it is something quite common. In Buddhism, it is quite well known that Buddha says that do not accept upon the authority of any religious figure, uh, any teacher, any scripture about what is truth. We have to find out for ourselves. Now, the other thing is that there are transcendent truths in religions, and transcendent truths can never be dogmatized because dogmatization is really the attempt to limit or crystallize what cannot be put in words. They are ineffable, and so to crystallize and dogmatize them would make them untrue. At most, they can be symbolized or represented. The third quality of the religion of the future I believe is that it will put emphasis on ethical living, not on doctrines, on theologies, or beliefs. Such ethical judgments will actually come, not again from authority, but from our own, our own deepest intuitions. Doctrines that violate such intuitions will fade away in importance. In my case, when I was studying the Bible, I came across a story in the Old Testament that says that during a Sabbath day, there was a man who was picking up sticks, and you're not supposed to work during Sabbath day. And when this man was discovered that he was picking up sticks, why was he picking up sticks? Maybe he needed firewood, because even on Sabbath day, you'll have to eat and cook something. So he was picking up sticks, and he was discovered, and the people brought him to Moses and said that he, this person is picking up sticks during Sabbath day, and what Moses did, not knowing what to do with this man, he consulted the Lord, and the Lord said, stone him to death. Now, when I read this, something deep within me just couldn't digest or agree with it. In other words, the children of this poor man will become orphans, simply because he was picking up sticks, maybe for firewood. Does he deserve to be stoned to death? So, 
where does this judgment come from? It comes from our own moral intuition, deep within us. When we have removed all these uh, layers of cultural and social morality, we'll begin to find that there are, there are deep principles of what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. Hence, in the end, we will have to rely on our deepest moral intuitions to decide on things. And the religions of the future will base its teachings on this, on this perception of what is true based on such deep intuitions. I've often asked people, uh, I teach comparative religion in our college, and I often ask my students who are sometimes, or many of them, are very fundamentalistic. They, they have drawn rigid borders or boundaries about who will be saved and who will not be saved. So I would usually ask them, I'd say, who will be saved, who will attain salvation? Is it a person who believes a doctrine, but who is bad or evil? Or is it a person who does not believe in the doctrine, but who is a good person? A lot of these young people, and even adults, would say, well, the good person will be saved. But some hesitate. Why? Because it goes against what they are taught. In other words, the teachings they receive go contrary to this moral intuition. So here we have a conflict between what is externally given to us and what is inwardly perceived by us. Then the fourth. The fourth quality of the future religions of the world will be a recognition of the mystical elements of their own faith as the core religious experience. Mystical experience, or what is sometimes called contemplative experience or spiritual experience, is an experience. It is not a dogma. It is not a belief. Sometimes the experience may even go contrary to what is being taught as a belief. But nevertheless, the experience is authentic. And through hundreds of years, people have realized that the mystical experience or the spiritual experience of people of one religion are similar to the mystical or spiritual experience of people of another religion and another religion. And when they see the common threads of this, they begin to realize that this deep source of the core religious experience, they are found in all the great religions, and they are essentially identical. And in the future, what today is widely acknowledged among the mystics of various religions will soon become commonplace knowledge of the religions of the world. Today, people like D.T. Suzuki, a Zen Buddhist, Hazrat Inayat Khan, a Sufi, Islamic Sufi, Thomas Merton, a Trappist Catholic monk, Abraham Maslow, a psychologist, Fritjof Schuwan, an expert in comparative religion. All of them recognize the commonality of mystical experience among the various religions. I'd like to share with you some of these statements of these well-known people about this insight of the commonality of mystical experience. I'll start first with Abraham Maslow, one of the greatest modern psychologists. He was the one who introduced the idea of self-actualized persons. He said in a book called Religion, Values, and Peak Experiences, and I quote, to the extent that all mystical or peak experiences are the same in their essence and have always been the same. All religions are the same in their essence and have always been the same. They, the religious practitioners, should therefore come to agree in principle on teaching that which is common to all of them. That is, whatever it is that big experiences teach in common and whatever is different about these illuminations can fairly be taken as localisms both in time and space, and are peripheral, expendable, and not essential. This something common, this something which is left over after we peel away all the localisms we may call the core religious experience 
or tra the transcendent experience, end of quote. The Sufi, famous Sufi teacher, Hazrat Inayat Khan wrote, what is religion to the mystic is a steady, okay, let me start off. What is religion to the mystic? The religion of the mystic is a steady progress towards unity. No one, he said, can be a mystic and call himself a Christian mystic, a Jewish mystic, or a Mohammedan mystic. For what is mysticism? Mysticism is something which erases from one's mind all idea of separateness. End of quote. Then let me quote from a Catholic source. There is a very well-known Jesuit priest and author. His name is William Johnston. He has one of the best tr uh, translations or renditions of the famous mystical work called Cloud of Unknowing. And he wrote, quote, all authentic religion originates with mystical experience, be it the experience of Jesus, of the Buddha, or Muhammad, or the seers and prophets of the Upanishads. End of quote. This comes from his book, The Inner Eye of Love. Then the fifth one, the fifth quality of the future religions of the world, I, I believe, is that these religions will be humanistic and spiritual rather than theocentric and doctrinal. Humanistic means what is important is human life. Theocentric means that what is important is the deity. In the religion of the future, there will be much, much less preoccupation about the anger of gods. Not, it will not be about the anger or jealousy of a god, but rather the development and growth of human beings. It will be less about worshiping of any god, but the experiencing of holiness within one's heart. It will not be about the punishment by any god, but rather the reaping of consequences due to one's own thoughts and actions. On the matter of the concept of God, because of these, the concept of the divine being will also change in the religion of the future. Actually, it has been changing in the past several centuries. Many people think let me go back to Christianity because I grew up in that background. Many people think that Christianity believes in one God. But look into its history. The gods of the Old Testament, or the, the gods, not God, but the gods of the Old Testament would be, you would see as different from the New Testament. And the God of these two, Old and New Testament, are different from the gods of the theologians. These are gods, the, the God in the abstract sense, and cannot be identified, for example, with the Old Testament. And the God of the mystics are again different from those other things. And so, in one religion, people believe in gods in different forms. It's not just one God. So, the concept of a divine being or divine reality will no longer be human life but transcendent and impersonal. It will see that the supreme being, whatever it is, is something transcendent, ineffable. We cannot even directly relate to it. It is something impersonal. In the world religions, there are such concepts. Like, for example, in the Kabbalah of Judaism, it is called Ein Sof. In Hinduism, it is the Parabrahman. In mystical Christianity, it is called Godhead or the Absolute. But the religions of the future will also recognize the existence of intermediate divine beings. The Buddhas, the Christ, the perfected human beings, the divine beings who are beyond humanity, but not the God of theology. This will change. It has already changed, but it's not very popular. When the time comes that these qualities are present, in the most dominant religions in the world, then there will be greater peace and harmony among religions. 
because the root causes of such divisions and conflicts and exclusion will now fade away and be absent. Now let me just share with you a few final thoughts on what can you and I do in order to promote the awakening, the coming, the development of truly wholesome religions. It is our task to do so. We cannot just leave it to others. We are participants in the changes in the social, in society, culture, um, education, religions from one generation to the other. The first thing that we can do is to promote ethical life as the basic core of religious life. Not everyone will be a mystic, but everyone can live a religious life. A life that does not harm or do injustice to others, a life of altruism and selflessness, a life of compassion and love. This is far more important than whether God is a unity or a trinity, whether Jesus is God or not, or whether one even believes in a God or not. So this would be something that we should promote. And if we are parents, this is something that we can inculcate among our children as the heart of the religious life, the ethical life. The second one is the popularization of the existence of mystical experiences of spiritual experiences. The mystical or spiritual life should be emphasized rather than doctrinal beliefs or dogmas. I have a friend who is a doctor of medicine and one day she emailed me and so she said she saw the, the notebook of her child, her daughter, who was grade two. She's probably about eight years old. And in the book were lessons about the doctrines decided on by a certain council more than a thousand years ago about the doctrine about Virgin Mary. Grade two, teaching all these things, in what way can it be relevant to the life of a grade two student? And you know this girl asked her mother, she's, because um, she was taught in her religion class that Mary is the mother of God. And so she asked her mother, she said, she said, Ma, if Mary is the mother of God, who made Mary? And of course, my friend could not answer this, and no one can answer this, actually. Try to answer it. If those, those uh, doctrines are to be taken, literally. Now, Meister Eckhart, one of the greatest mystics in the history of Christianity, wrote in one of his sermons, when a person has true spiritual experience, he may boldly drop external disciplines, even those to which he is bound by a vow. In other words, spiritual and mystical experience takes, takes primacy over doctrines and belief systems. The third thing that we can do, we should do, is that we must oppose aggressiveness or abuse of sectarian powers. When once the power feels that there is a growing collective opposition, they begin to be more careful. It is when we are silent and passive that those who are abusing certain powers, social, military, political, will begin to be more bold in trying to impose their will on the hapless masses. It is the duty of more knowledgeable citizens to voice their concerns or opposition, especially at this age when social networks or forums allow anyone to express their views. The fourth thing that we can do is to promote non-sectarian education. A religious school or a sectarian school pr promotes primarily one religion. Some sectarian schools may be liberal, others may be intolerant, but the general effect of such education is that it nurtures young minds according to a particular mold with an unconscious prejudice against other religions. This perpetuates religious divisiveness for another generation and the next generation and the next generation. 
In some countries, like in the Philippines, many government schools which are supposed to be non-sectarian may actually still be sectarian in an informal manner. It depends upon how dominant one particular religion is in the community. When it is dominant, then teachers and students may tend to pray or do rituals according to that dominant religion. In other words, that religion becomes the de facto religion of the school. Even if there are many others in the school who belong to other religions. I once attended such a prayer session and I could see people of other religions wearing other garments and they did not participate and they felt outside, they felt outcasts. These minorities tend to be silent or submissive for fear of being treated as outcasts by the majority. It would be best if parents, teachers, and students can propose that non-sectarian government or private schools should truly be non-sectarian. If they will have a common prayer, then the prayer should be something that all members of the community can resonate with. Or they can have two or three kinds of prayer coming from different religions, like what we do here during convention. In this way, the school community will feel that the school prospects religion but does not favor any particular religious denomination. And finally, it is our task to teach young people to be open-minded and to discriminate between blind belief and the use of reason, science, and common sense. The key to the transformation of religion lies in the children and youth of each generation. When the young are not unduly indoctrinated by the elders, but in, by views that tend to look down upon other religions, they grow up with a more open mind, tolerant of alternative views, and will tend not to discriminate against other faiths. In our college, I teach comparative religion and philosophy. The students usually come from traditional religions and quite a number of them from very fundamentalistic religious backgrounds. Through the years, I have realized that when young people are exposed to basic questions that broaden their views about things, they no longer go back to the narrow views that were based on traditional beliefs. This is not an attempt to undermine religious beliefs, no. It is to teach young people to learn how to approach the quest for truth with openness, with reason, and with intuition. Here is a principle that we should look into. Minds that have been made op to open while young are almost impossible to close when they become adults. On the other hand, young minds which have been taught to be closed when they are young are very difficult to open in later life. Our task then is to address the way of thinking of young people. The best way I believe to teach young people is to ask deep and basic questions and allow them to explore, reason out, and discuss. They will see because they are as yet fresh and they have not yet been uh, too much indoctrinated by unreasonable things. Then they will begin to see the conflicts, the contradiction, the incongruences. And once they see what is sensible and reasonable, they will never be able to unsee it anymore. Then the methods of the old narrow religions will no longer shackle or imprison their minds. They will become free and more capable of finding out what truth is. In one of the writings, one of the latest, later writings of Blavatsky, Key to Theosophy, she speaks about the importance of theosophical education and that the purpose of theosophical education is to nurture young people to become free in all forms, free intellectually, free morally, to be able to pursue them according to their own deepest intuitions and not be afraid because of social conditioning. Our task then, my brothers and sisters, is to see, to help this world, make this world a place where religion is a blessing rather than a curse. And in looking at all these studies and the various facets of religion, we see that religions 
in its highest mystical and spiritual aspect, is a blessing to human life, for it brings out the deepest and profoundest in human nature. But religion as a vehicle of control, of fear and dominance, has been a curse to mankind, for it has engendered superstition, oppression, cruelty, violence, and wars. And hence, our task is to make religion of the future a blessing rather than a curse, a fount of love rather than hatred, a spiritual ashram rather than a school of dogma. And for those among us who see this as an urgent agenda in human and social development, we must take action individually and collectively. Then in our own little way, we are helping to bring about the coming of the more enlightened religions of the future, which will pave the way to peace and harmony in our society. Good evening to all of you. Thank you, Vic, for sharing your deep thoughts with us. A profound call to unity, isn't it? Some of us here present are that fortunate that they can attend your School of the Wisdom about self-transformation from the 9th till the 20th of January. Thank you. Um, thank you all for attending. This session is closed. <laughs>